Next on call, learn about inflammatory bowel disease. The typical flare-up will last about two months. And related health concerns. Funding for this program is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. There's the, the valve. Oh, and which was healthier, the yogurt and the bagel? I'm going to start by measuring the size of it. You could also add grilled chicken to this recipe. Blow hard, blow, 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 keep pushing. Pull red handle to open bag. Hello and welcome to On Call. I'm Tammy Watson. Some of us would rather not talk about it. Diarrhea, cramps, blood in the stool, and similar problems that don't make good dinner conversation in polite society. But these are real health concerns, and in certain circumstances, we should talk about them. A better understanding of conditions like Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and colitis can only help to improve the lives of individuals diagnosed with these problems. So tonight, we're going to talk about when your bowels are inflamed, and our physicians are standing by ready to answer your questions. With me in the studio are Dr. Philip Tanner and our medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. You can call in with your questions about bowel disease right now. Our phone number is 1-888-DOCTOR-ON-CALL. Again, that's 1-888-376-6225. And helping answer the phones tonight are volunteers from the South Dakota State University Pre-Professional Science Club. Dr. Holm, before you introduce our guest, a good way to start out our conversation is to ask you this. When is a bowel problem serious enough to send a patient from a family doctor to a specialist like Dr. Tanner? Uh, generally, when it comes to the inflammatory bowel diseases, I happily just turn them over <laughs> to the expert because uh, it, it is a tough, tough uh, territory. And, um, and oftentimes, you're going, to be, you're going to be using steroids. You're going to be use, you may be even moving into the biologics there's some uh, very uh, powerful medications and complications. And you know, you really want to have the expert at least start the ball rolling. I mean, I follow a lot of patients who periodically are um, seen by the uh, gastroenterologist, but, but, um, but when, when I've made the decision or the, this discovery that there is inflammation that's significant and long lasting, it's not just an infection, then I call for help. As a layperson, this is going to be a good show. There's a lot that we're going to learn tonight. Yeah, and this is a, this can be a very terrible disease, but it's a lot better disease now than it used to be. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm very pleased to introduce to you our guest for this evening, Dr. Philip Tanner. Dr. Tanner practices at Sanford Clinic Gastroenterology in Sioux Falls and specializes in gastroenterology, the branch of medicine that focuses on the stomach and the intestine and the human digestive tract from the top of the lips all the way to the anal verge. So we're glad to have you here, Phil. Thanks. Uh, I, I would say that uh, I have to explain the story. We had Christina Hill Jensen planned for to, uh, tonight's show and she called in. She had a voice that's worse than mine <laughs> yeah, it's and going said, around. I can't come. And so in the last minute this morning, we got a hold of you, and you're willing to come on. You know, we thank you so much for, for making it. I'm very pleased and happy to be here. You didn't have to read a lot of books or anything, get prepared. You kind of already knew this stuff, right? That's why we asked you. <laughs> I was happy that I didn't have scrubs on today. Yeah, so. that's good. So tell us a little bit about your story. Um, who are you, and wh what do you do? Well, I'm a gastroenterologist. I'm board certified, 
and uh, I've been at Sanford uh, in Sioux Falls for five years. Um, before that I was in Wilmer, Minnesota, and before that I was in India doing some missionary work. Before that I was in the Army. Um, so what, what branch of the Army and where did that take you? Well, Medical Corps, and um, I did my medical school at the University of Minnesota and uh, went through med school on an Army scholarship and uh, took me from Minneapolis to Honolulu. And then oh, that's that, tough. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> <coughs> and uh, then back to Kansas and then uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, so you didn't take any time overseas at, uh, in... Uh, I did not. Okay. No. So. I was in training at, during the years of Desert Storm. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we'll, you know, what we need are questions from our audience. And so fire up those pens, give us a call. Uh, we we want to answer them. We'll be right back after this break. As one million people in the U.S. have inflammatory bowel disease. IBD symptoms begin for most between the ages of 15 and 30. To give us all a better understanding of what it's like to live with bowel problems, On Call met with a man diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome and colitis. He's a Main Street businessman from Brookings, South Dakota. Jim Van Arum has a steady hand and a deft touch. His years of experience as a barber are obvious. But what's not so obvious about Van Arum is that he has lived with bowel disease for around 30 years. Well, it's mostly normal life. I have flare-ups uh, once in a while, not a great deal. Uh, less, the longer I have it, the more I learn to control it. And um, the typical flare-up will last about two months. Van Arum says that it's important to balance work and rest and daily activities because stress, poor diet, and not enough sleep can aggravate irritable bowel syndrome. With me, it starts out with uh, some blood in the stool and some cramping, not very much anymore. When I first uh, got the disease, it, it did uh, more cramping. And then you'd have to go to the bathroom about four times more than you normally would during a, during a day. I think the best way to prevent it is to make sure you get plenty of rest and eat properly, exercise, and uh, don't try to work too much. Van Aram was first diagnosed with irritable bowel and colitis at age 27, and initially it was a difficult diagnosis to accept. I used to try to hide that from people, but I don't, you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. There's always somebody that has it worse. There's always a lot of people that have it worse than, you know, uh, you can live with colitis and do normal everyday things, you know, and once you learn to control it, it's a piece of cake, really. It's, uh, you can do it. You can. Yep. Doctors, Mr. Van Arum manages his condition with medication, a drug called sulfalazine, and close attention to just maintaining a healthy lifestyle. And he, he did make it clear to me that, um, you know, it's a hard diagnosis to deal with, but there's so much we need to talk about. Um, I was going to ask you about the kind of dealing with that type of diagnosis, the emotions, but then we need to clarify body parts and different syndromes because a lot of these conditions have the same symptom, you have problems when you go to the bathroom, diarrhea or blood in the stool, and it, it isn't all the same thing. No. I, I wanted to make sure to say a special thank you to Mr. Van Arum for courageous uh, willingness to talk about it. I mean, people really, that's not one of those things you, most people would, but, uh, would go on TV f about, but, you know, it's one of those things where he, you can uh, learn from his experience, and he was willing to give that to us for the public good. Uh, I also would uh, make the uh, clarify inflammatory d bowel disease versus yeah. uh, uh, versus uh, uh, irritable bowel syndrome. The, uh, colitis. What's the difference, uh, Phil, between colitis and uh, irritable bowel syndrome? <clears throat> irritable bowel syndrome is an irritability to the GI tract. It's very common. It's particularly common in young women. But then that's also the same group that has the predominance of uh, inflammatory bowel disease where there are ulcers uh, within the GI tract. And it's hard sometimes to distinguish. It's hard as a physician 
to distinguish which patients have ir an irritable bowel syndrome, which has a very benign prognosis. Um, patients who have IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, they uh, will never uh, lose a day in their life expectancy. They will never have to have surgery for irritable bowel syndrome. They won't have to be on expensive medications for irritable bowel syndrome. That's opposite, though, for inflammatory bowel disease. They uh, have several uh, potential complications of their disease. They have to have surgery at different times. They have to be on expensive immunomodulators or immunosuppressive medications. So let's define, uh, okay, so when we say inflammatory bowel disease, okay, there's inflammation. Right. Versus, and colitis is, it means by definition, inflammation of the colon. Uh, but uh, There is this condition called ulcerative colitis, and there's a condition called colitis or proctitis, and there's this condition called Crohn's disease. Could mm -hmm. you help define the difference? Sure. Crohn's disease can affect anywhere from the mouth to the anus, and it tends to be skipping around in its areas of distribution. There tends to be areas of normal bowel when we look with a scope in between the areas that are inflamed. Ulcerative colitis uh, tends to be uniform in its involvement. It tends to involve the rectum. Uh, in one patient, it might be the rectum and the sigmoid portion of the colon, which is the lowest portion. And in another patient, it could be the entire colon. Uh, so it starts really at the rectum and it spreads backwards. It, it, it can spread, although it tends to be that when you have a flare of the disease, the same general area is involved. So in one patient, it might simply be this left side of the colon, which is the more distal or the closest to the rectum uh, okay. portion. Yep. So those are types of irritable or inflammatory bowel disease. Inflammation, so inflammatory bowel disease. IBS and IBD. And, and they're a, different. And totally different. Okay, so if I like think S is for safe and D is for danger, is that yeah, kind of a good way of <laughs> sure. keeping it? I, I need to think that way. Yep. So <laughs> irritable, I mean, uh, the, and that can be very debilitating. People uh, have terrible symptoms from it, but it's not dangerous. Okay. It's just irritable. Whereas inflammation is another story. There's okay. there is a destructive inflammatory process. So what's the uh, so you you say that uh, ulcerative colitis or colitis uh, generally it will always involve the anus and it will kind of it could go partly up or it could go all the way across or it can go all the way through the whole entire colon. Right. Um, whereas uh, Crohn's disease is spotty. Right. right, and it can involve the small intestine and not even involve the colon. Right, about a third of the patients have uh, small bowel uh, Crohn's disease only. About a third have Crohn's colitis, where it uh, involves their large bowel or their colon. And about a third have both involvement in small bowel and colon. Now, now I mean, if we talk about the, the, the uh, story, it's the mouth, the throat, that can be involved can be, it's pretty rare. Pretty rare. The esophagus can be involved. Again, pretty rare. Pretty rare. Stomach can be involved. Pretty rare. Small. Uh, Duodenum, that's which is the beginning of the small bowel, a little more common. And then you travel through the three segments of the small intestine. It gets more common as you get near the... Uh, yes. And, and we have learned an incredible amount about Crohn's disease in the last decade because we have something called video capsule endoscopy. Um, where they swallow a digital camera, yep, and it takes about fifty-six thousand pictures as it moves through the small bowel. Um, How big is that it's camera? Not, it's a little bit <laughs> smaller than this, this thing that's looking at us over here. <laughs> what, what size it's would it be? Pretty close to my microphone size. Okay, so j yeah. just the size of a good size vitamin pill. Yep. It's kind of all right. Yep. And it takes a bunch of pictures. Are you watching it as it goes through, or you, it just takes a, a film? It wa wirelessly transmits them to a little unit like a beeper on your belt. And then it gets downloaded onto the computer, and we can watch it later, speed it up, slow it down, and watch it like a movie. Yeah. Hmm. There's, there's so much. Uh, we've already got a stack of questions coming in, but I wanted to ask about the causes of these disease. Do I catch it from somebody? Yeah. Am I born with it? Tell what? us. Tell us exactly what causes these. 
Oh, thanks, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> um, the causes for uh, Crohn's disease and for ulcerative colitis are not known. Um, <clears throat> there are uh, some genetic predispositions. It does occur more often in families. Whether that's uh, some environmental uh, commonality uh, versus uh, actual gene um, <clears throat> is not been clearly defined. Um, <clears throat> there are some ideas that it may have something to do with an infectious uh, process. Uh, the particular organism has not been identified. There's a disorder in cattle called yonis that's uh, uh, atypical mycobacterium that uh, has been postulated. But again, it's not been um, proven out. That's kind of, kind of like TB. Right, yep. Okay. But that's speculation. It is. Okay, so in other words, we have no idea. <laughs> no. Well, I mean, now, we have an idea. There, but we there don't. are other causes of colitis that I, we should kind of just make a mention of. There's talk, a, talk about radiation uh, proctitis, radiation induced colitis. There's infectious colitis, like a Clostridium difficile or C. Okay. difficile. Overgrowth colitis. from uh, yes. antibiotics. Right. <clears throat> uh, tell us about E. coli induced, I mean, these special types of E. coli that you right. get in, in certain hamburgers. Hamburger. Bad hamburger or uh, undercooked hamburger. Um, you can get a Enterohemorrhagic uh, E. coli infection. Entero means Whatever small that intestine. Is. Well, hemorrhagic meaning bloody death. bloody diarrhea is the, the um, is what comes out. Yep. Yeah. And and it's from bad meat, uh, and <clears throat> it can cause uh, kidney uh, dysfunction, uh, and it can cause problems <clears throat> with. Uh, severe anemia. Um, it can be very serious, uh, particularly in young and elderly. Okay. Um, most people recover from it, though. Yeah, but and of course, if you use an antibiotic to treat it, what happens? It gets worse. Yeah, it does. Yep. You cannot okay, use an antibiotic. That's messing yep. around with the the good the good fauna well, in our well, gut, I, you know, is that? I don't know well, why this, a, oh, this, oh, <coughs> this special E. coli gets worse, but I mean, a lot of diarrhea Ill infections get worse if you treat them with antibiotics. Oh. Why is that? Well, you knock out the good bacteria, and um, C. difficile is one that is most common in terms of an infectious colitis <coughs> that is antibiotic associated. Uh, sometimes we can't identify which bacteria is causing the problem. Everyone has a bacteria called C. difficile in their GI tract. Um, they might get an antibiotic for a sinus infection or a presumed bronchitis where it really was a virus, but mm. uh, <clears throat> they wipe out the good bacteria in their GI tract and this C. difficile uh, bacteria can then cause a inflammatory process within the colon. Have you seen anyone die from C. difficile? I have not. I've seen them get very sick. And and sometimes they yeah. uh, have you had colons removed? I mean, I, I've re that has yep yeah, that has happened. Yeah. So uh, gee, this is <coughs> highlight this point. Are you ready? Yes. Let me make this point. One major, big time reason, not to treat the cold with an antibiotic. Ask me what I'm taking for this cold that I have. <laughs> no antibiotic. I'm leaving my seat, my uh, my colonic uh, uh, my intact. flora intact. Okay. Please, no antibiotics for for uh, for the common cold, and this is the reason. All right. Well, I got a stack of questions. You want okay. another crack at him before we hit the hit the questions? Uh, you know, we're, we're on a roll. Let's take. Some okay. Um, a question, I believe, from here on. Uh, call or this was emailed in early. I have constant diarrhea for my morning bowel movements. There are three to five of them starting almost normal and progressing to almost completely watery. It only lasts for several hours, not all day. I have had a colonoscopy. It showed nothing abnormal and a stool specimen tested, nothing abnormal. I've tried eliminating various things individually and nothing makes a difference. Imodium AD gives me such cramps that I don't like to take it. Any suggestions? So what's your approach? I mean, my first approach is eliminate milk for a while. 
And the other thing that I generally look at is, is there gallbladder disease? And I can give them a trial of a Questran or a Questran-like drug that helps bind the bile that can cause this. Uh, that, but it might be irritable bowel syndrome. It may very well be irritable bowel syndrome. You know, there's what I kind of think of as some red flags, and those are complaints that a patient might have that are more concerning when I hear them. When I hear that there is blood with their bowel movements, when I hear that they're losing weight, when I hear that they are awakening from being in a good sleep, to have a bowel movement. Uh, right. That's a clue that <coughs> tells you there's something bad. That there's something more going on than simply an irritability to their GI tract. Now, the fact that they have to get up to go to the bowel, to have a bowel movement is a sign of trouble. So, is, any oh. thoughts on what the caller? Well, another, another thing that um, happens, and I'd like to mention this because it, it, it's a, kind of a big deal, and that is that Occasionally patients will say, Doctor, why do I need another colonoscopy? I just had one a year ago and it was normal. Well, it may have been normal in terms of there were no polyps identified, but did the doctor that did the exam, did they do it because they were looking for polyps only or were they told ahead of time that the patient had diarrhea? Did they do biopsies throughout the colon? Because there is this disorder called microscopic colitis where with a colonoscope, things look fine. Under the microscope, there's mm -hmm. inflammatory changes and um, that's actually a separate category from ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease is this disorder called microscopic colitis where they they have an inability to reabsorb the water, which is what the job of the colon is. And so they end up having diarrhea and they can even get dehydrated from it. it tends to happen more often in elderly. Okay. It's interesting that uh, you, you highlighted uh, something about the bowels that we should say. Small intestine absorbs nutrients. Right. Really, the stomach grinds things up. Small intestine absorbs all these nutrients. It's unbelievable organ, the small intestine. Mm -hmm. Along comes the large intestine. And that's where the bacteria is, and the bacteria are kind of living there symbiotically with us, and all the water is absorbed. Now that's the function of it. That is. Now I, I wanted to highlight before we went any further. Why do we need to make the diagnosis of ulcerative colitis and sometimes do biopsies, be, even when it looks normal? Um, my question to you is: Do these people have the same problem that people with classic ulcerative colitis has? which is to eventually see cancer? Um, <clears throat> they do not. They, they have uh, the possibility of becoming dehydrated. Um, some have some weight loss associated with it. Um, and it can be debilitating if they have a hard time getting out of the house okay. and socially it's doing a, things. So it's, it's a functional problem. Right. Like. But um, in its responsive to low-dose uh, medication called Entacort, um, which, is? <clears throat> which is a low, a low uh, steroid. Um, <clears throat> and it's a, a medicine that's pretty well tolerated by most patients. Yes. Okay. Let's uh, make the point about ulcerative colitis and risk for cancer. Um, the repeated flaring of ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, more so with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And just to, terms, flare means when it kicks in and you when get diarrhea. And, right. Okay. Diarrhea, blood. Yeah. The, the natural history of the inflammatory bowel diseases is that there will be periods where it flares and it's very active, tends to be related to stresses, and um, will put the patient, maybe will escalate their uh, anti-inflammatory medical regimen and get things under control again, get them back into, if you want to call it, remission or a quiescent, quiet period of their disease. And it'll be that way for maybe weeks to months to maybe even years, uh, but eventually they'll have another flare of their disease. And it's those flares that bring on a risk for cancer. And it does. And, and that's why ulcerative colitis, because it is uniform involving a lot more surface area of the colon 
and that repeated cycling of inflammation quieting down, inflammation quieting down, cell turnover, the cells that line the colon turn over with every flare, that increases a person's risk of having one cell that's a little bit abnormal and that can develop into a cancer. So, I had, a, I had a doctor give a lecture to me one time, this was years ago, and I went to a, a, a thing at Hopkins, and, and he said, well, it isn't a question of if these people are going to, with ulcerative colitis, are going to get cancer, it's when. That's pretty scary. And it was, and he, his point was you just, when, once you've had colon, uh, ulcerative colitis for this many years, just remove the colon, including that anus, okay, there and go with a colostomy. Risk. Uh, how do you feel about that? That's changed. People feel like, you know, you can really carefully monitor by colonoscopy now, right? Well, um, there's a couple of different things there. One is... And we have to be quick because we've got to take a break. <laughs> we've got a lot better medicines today than we did 20 years ago. And, and because of that, we're keeping people in that quiet period a lot more. Uh, great. Okay. Well, we're going to keep moving on, and talking with a qualified dietitian is never a bad idea when you're dealing with bowel disease. A dietitian can offer tips on nutrition and help you find foods that are easier to digest. We met with a registered dietitian to learn about the food choices and eating behaviors that, generally speaking, work well for people living with bowel disease. A trip through the grocery store is just another errand for most people, but it's an opportunity for individuals with bowel disease to make smart food choices that can improve their condition. And choosing nutrient-dense foods should be a consideration in those choices. That's according to Megan Woodroska, a dietitian and nutritionist with High V Grocery. Irritable bowel um, and inflammatory bowel disease um, when it causes inflammation in the intestines, nutrients are not well absorbed. Um, so macronutrients that provide calories, um, like fats, carbohydrates, proteins, are not well absorbed. Um, and also micronutrients, such as vitamins and minerals. Um, and when that happens, you can have severe weight loss, um, protein malnutrition, and vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Foods that may be well tolerated by one individual with bowel disease may not digest well for another patient with similar symptoms. Woodroska says that one way to learn which food products will and won't cause bowel symptoms is to use a food diary. A food diary is basically where you're writing down all the foods that you're consuming and you need to be as specific as possible. So what type of food, what quantity, and even what time you ate it at. Um, this can be very important because with IBD, uh, the diet is somewhat individualized. So if you're trying to identify foods that you do not tolerate very well um, and are causing diarrhea, it's very helpful if you can write it down because most of us, let's face it, don't even remember what we ate yesterday. So if you can write those things down, you can start to see patterns. Woodroska says that if an individual with bowel disease is dealing with a flare-up, a low-fiber diet can help alleviate symptoms. For the most part, if you're having a flare-up, I would recommend a low-fiber diet, which is kind of backwards from what you would usually recommend. So that means choosing refined grains like white bread versus whole wheat, um, refined grains, cereals, and even to the extent of peeling off the skin of fruits and vegetables because that's where most of the fiber is found. So if you have an apple or a potato, you want to take the skin off. Some other things maybe to consider um, is having small meals more frequently. So having a, a small meal or snack every three to four hours, especially if you've been having some weight loss because that'll be easier um, for you to consume more calories. And just make sure when you are choosing snacks that it's something um, nutrient dense. You know, a banana may be the same amount of calories as a handful of potato chips, but there's going to be a lot more nutrients found in the banana. And if you're already having vitamin deficiencies, you definitely want to make sure you're choosing nutrient-dense foods. Crohn's disease occurs when the lining and wall of the intestines become inflamed and ulcers develop. It often occurs in the lower part of the small intestine. Thank you for joining us tonight. We're talking about bowel disease and here in the studio ready to answer your questions are Dr. Philip Tanner and the on-call medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. And okay, you want to follow up on the dietitian, and then I'm going to dive into questions. All right, um, I, I must say it's great to work with Megan and, and uh, isn't it wonderful that the Hy-Vee grocery store and the Brookings Health System Hospital 
are willing to support her so that people who have bowel problems or, or, or uh, any kind of uh, gut problems, uh, people who have malabsorption syndromes, and uh, that they can consult those people uh, all the time. Do you, do you use the I, grocery store dietitian? I use our, our in, I live in Sioux Falls, of course, and um, I am sending patients to the high V stores uh, and to consult with the dietitians there very frequently. And you agreed with what her, she said, low fiber, right? Low yeah. fiber for Crohn's disease. Right. No, nobody says low fiber. Everything I ever read is high fiber. But yeah. a lot of people have partial bowel obstruction, not just Crohn's disease, but people have, and so what do you, how do you say? Well, um, particularly patients who have Crohn's disease that involves their small bowel can have narrowing uh, of the small bowel because of the chronic repeated inflammation and something we call stricturing, narrowing. And uh, a diet that's high in fiber, uh, nuts and uh, raw vegetables, uh, fruits that have the peelings on them, are things that are very difficult to get past those narrowed areas mm -hmm. of the small bowel. And so it seems a little bit opposite of what you hear in the news about, oh, I should be eating a high fiber diet. But for inflammatory bowel disease patients, they should be eating a diet, particularly if they have Crohn's, uh, that's low in residue, low in fiber, and they may need to take a supplement. They may need to take some Metamucil or Citrusil or some form of granular fiber just to get enough fiber in their diet. Yeah, let me ask you about all sort of, uh, about uh, diverticulitis or diverticulosis actually, that where you have pockets. Sure. Okay, everybody, you know, everybody's afraid of popcorn and nuts, you know, and, the, and, the, and I say, nope, with that disease, you want high fiber. Do you agree? I agree. I agree. Um, <clears throat> a high fiber diet. Uh, it you know there's a whole lot of patients out there that have diverticulosis and who never have a problem with it. Uh, have no what, idea that they it? have it. No pockets. These <clears throat> diverticulosis are pockets that occur along the wall of the colon, particularly a portion of the colon that's just above the rectum called the sigmoid, and uh, these pockets are actually they form because there's a little artery that's piercing through the wall right at that point. And it's, it's kind of like how a basketball will get a little nubby along the seam. It's a little weak spot. And so a little outpouching occurs on the wall of the colon. And a, a patient may have a few. They may have a hundred. Hundreds. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and they can be kind of wide-mouthed wide open diverticuli um, and just the presence of the pockets is called diverticulosis. If those pockets get an infection in them, which tends not to occur when they're nice wide open ones, but the ones that have kind of a narrow tight mouth on them, they can get an infection and they can present with pain down in the left lower portion of their abdomen. Um, they can develop fevers. They can have diarrhea associated with that. It's not a chronic diarrhea. It's an acute issue. It, it can also it mimic uh, colitis. Well, it is by definition a colitis because there's inflammation of the colon. Right. But they can present with bloody diarrhea. And yep. it's, they can it's lead to. Yeah. Okay. All right, questions. Um, a lady, 83-year-old female who suffers terribly painful rectal fissure. Um, last July, she had a total hip replacement on her right side continue to struggle with her left hip and both knees, have been taking fentanyl 25 milligram patches for these problems. Since October, when I discovered I had the fissure, I have been taking Hyomax 125 milligrams four times a day to decrease painful muscle spasms. I take Metamucil three times a day with plenty of fluids to help with the consistency of her bowel movements, not taking any other prescriptions. This is ongoing. It's horribly painful. Yeah. So what do you do that, with fissures and rectal and pain? That's like a, a tear or a crack in the skin yeah, around the is. anus, right? Well, okay. And there are a lot of people who have rectal pain. And a lot of that's related to previous hemorrhoidal surgery. I, I run from hemorrhoidal surgery. I try to tell people to you know, delay if you can. There's times for it, but gee, that can be problematic. Am I wrong? I agree. No, you're not. Um, <clears throat> patients who have been taking narcotics uh, like the fentanyl uh, patch, 
um, they are predisposed to difficulties with constipation. Okay, and the constipation and stuff's you know, they, just moving slower and the right, the and they strain to have a bowel movement, and they can develop a little tear. It might start like a little paper cut, right at the anus. But if that is repeatedly kind of pulled apart time after time and it becomes over months, it's just not going to heal well. Um, there is a, a formulation that we actually use sometimes, uh, nitroglycerin paste, uh, the nitroglycerin type uh, jelly that is used uh, for cardiac patients can sometimes be mixed up with uh, and formulated with petroleum jelly and used on the anus. That helps some. A high fiber diet helps some, but sometimes they actually do need to see a colorectal surgeon and have some surgery done there. Yeah. Okay. I, I really encourage a lot of vanny cream to use to help you moisturize as you yeah. wipe in the end. And I, I, I use plenty of plain stool softeners, nothing with laxatives, but up to six a day to get it good and, and soft and and Miralax is a, I'm a fan of Miralax. So and those things, get it nice and loose so you don't have to push something right. through and problematic when you're using narcotics. You know, uh, there are an abundance of laxatives out there and the majority of them are a chemical irritant type laxative that uh, over time you'll develop a tolerance to mm. and they work less and less well. There are a couple of different laxatives, though, that are called osmotic agents, and they help to hold on to water. You remember that the job of the colon is to dehydrate or pull the water off back into the bloodstream and recycle it, use it in the body. And uh, <coughs> Miralax, also called Glycolax, or uh, Milk of Magnesia, are a couple of agents that work as osmotic agents and are safe for you to take yeah. long term. I, I, I'd highlight the run from the stimulant kind of laxatives because it's like heroin. You got to go higher and higher doses and then when you stop it you have this tremendous withdrawal. And what right. is the withdrawal? Constipation. Um, just real quick, I don't want to pick on brand names, but what? Correctol or, or, or Senna. Yep. or the, those, any of the stimulants, those are the ones bad. That are, okay. And yep. if you do colates or you do the stool softeners, go with stool softeners without the laxative. Never take the laxative. Okay. Um, uh, I, yep, ring in the right note. Right. Question from Huron. Caller is a lady age 69, has diabetes, is on insulin, and has gastroparesis, and she needs to know more about the drug Reglan. Her doctor's more or less opposed to prescribing it to her, says it's a last resort kind of thing. Her pharmacist says that it helps. It's kind of the only known game in town. So yeah, gastroparesis, gastroparesis is... What is that? Gastroparesis yeah. is uh, when the, the stomach fails to empty. Uh, like a person's heart, there is a small area that acts as a pacemaker uh, within a person's heart, and there's a gastric pacemaker that is within the stomach. Every impulse, every contraction of the stomach uh, starts in this small area within the stomach and that travels all the way down the small intestine and all the way down the colon to the rectum. And like a toothpaste a, tube. Right. In a resting but it state starts at that stomach. In the resting state it happens about three times per minute. After you had a meal, it's up to twenty, twenty five times a minute. Uh, these contraction waves. In patients who have gastroparesis, for some reason they lose a lot of their motility in their stomach. They often then also have difficulties with constipation. They can be on a diet called a gastroparesis diet that uh, basically is a low residue, low fiber diet because it's harder to have the stomach empty high fibrous foods. But then, uh, <clears throat> and, and uh, I suspect that in this patient it's related to her long-standing diabetes, which is a it's a known complication of that disease. Yeah, that they lose the nerve, nerve yep. function. So and uh, in one <coughs> sentence, because we've got tons of questions mm -hmm. to hit, what should we do or what should, would you do different? Um, Reglan has uh, gotten a lot of bad publicity. The FDA has actually put a black box warning on it because of 
uh, a certain type of uh, movement and neurologic disorder that comes along with uh, taking that medication. So it's used much uh, more uh, cautiously now. Um, there's an antibiotic called erythromycin that has as a side effect a pro-motility effect, uh, promotes motility. Erythromycin, you said? And so we've been using that some for promoting motility associated with treating gastroparesis. And there's, a, there's one other medicine called dumperidone which can be formulated um, in some pharmacies called specialty pharmacies. Not Dom Perignon. No, a okay. little no. different. Yeah. <laughs> no champagne. That's what I'm going to remember. Yeah. Okay. So that's a tough question. And there's some experimental stimulants and devices, yep. pacemakers. gastric pacemakers. Okay. Uh, question from Alexandria. Caller had, uh, help me with this terminology, colonus colitis. And is this a lifelong thing that flares back up? If so, what causes Collagenous it? Collagenous colitis. Collagenous colitis uh, is uh, similar to a microscopic uh, colitis. Um, <clears throat> it is a thickening of a certain layer in the colon. Um, and <clears throat> there Doo -doo. are... Don't know. Don't know. Yeah. And, and it, it primarily they have diarrhea. Diarrhea. Um, and because it uh, prevents good water absorption through the wall of the colon. They can't get the water from inside the colon out to the bloodstream. Then tends to lose water. Anything uh, you can do to treat it? Uh, you could try to antacort. You can try to slow things down in the GI tract with imodium. imodium. Yep. Yep. Steroids and imodium. Yeah. Okay. A uh, question from Lake Norden. Um, they had a hiatal her Hiatal surgery, surgery um, has dumping syndrome, has diarrhea all the time. Is there a medication this uh, female caller, age 76, can take so she won't have diarrhea after eating a meal? And she asks about Imodium. Yeah, that, you, dumping syndrome, which explain I that very quickly, that and then what do you do Ooh, for it? That's a tough one to do, explain well, small, quickly. Yeah. But <laughs> bypass surgery, gastric um, bypass surgery, and a yeah. variety of things. Uh, what happens is they actually have poor emptying of their GI tract and so the liquids that they've consumed run through okay. and empty quickly. The solids end up uh, coming much later and, and they end up getting diarrhea because of it. it uh, there are no medications that help with dumping syndrome but what you can do is you can separate the solid things from the liquids by at least a couple of hours. So you're not drinking at the same time you're eating solid food. That's okay. not, my mother said and to drink more milk during the meal. Yep, you, know, you don't do that with dumping syndrome. Ignore mom. Yep. Okay, so you, and, you eat, you separate. And then um, trying to stay away from simple sugars, but rather complex carbohydrates, and maybe get the dietitian involved in, in yeah. giving you some good uh, advice oh. about complex carbohydrates. Go, go to hy okay. and talk to Megan about complex carbohydrates. <laughs> okay, yeah. so that's the... Uh, Fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Okay. A yeah. uh, question from Sioux Falls. Uh, male collar is dealing with constipation. Is has taken three or four stool softeners a day. Should he use prune juice? What more can he do to deal with constipation? Let me throw this at you and then, then tell me how you would do it differently. My standard is I start with fiber. I like or, uh, food fiber rather than artificial fibers, but I, fiber one, breakfast food. And I like ground flaxseed because it's got oil and it kind of greases the skids and it's also heart healthy. If that's not enough, I add to that stool softeners and I go one to three twice, once or twice a day. I go up to six. If that's not enough, I add to the f fiber and the stool softener Miralax, and I, there's recently been found that it's better than Sorbitol, which was my old standby, yeah. uh, and or milk of magnesia. Generally, I've, I mean, that plan generally would make a rock have a bowel movement. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, would you change that advice? Or would you correct it? I would not. Uh, I think that is a very good plan. Um, you should be looking at 25 to 30 grams of fiber a day. Um, there are some nice uh, online resources available to uh, find out, okay, how much fiber am I getting in a half a cup of this or a cup of this? So you yep. can uh, look that up and keep a journal to, as to how much fiber you're actually getting. Supplement it with uh, 
some metamucil or citrusyl or fibercon or uh, just a generic fiber uh, cilium. Yeah. <coughs> um, and then I too go to the osmotic agents like uh, Miralax or Glycolax uh, or uh, Milk of Magnesia. You're and then another category that's relatively new is a, a medication called Amatiza, which uh, is a chloride channel blocker. And that's uh, pretty technical, but uh, the chloride is one of the, there's a pump in the wall of the colon um, in every cell, and that's the way that the water is pumped out of the lumen of the colon into the bloodstream, and this medication blocks that pump and it's is helpful. Looks good. It, uh, it's expensive, though. It is. Like $150, $200 or more yeah. per month, but it's very helpful in the right time. Yeah. You're not a stool softener fan. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to touch back on where you said, you know, keep track, write down what you eat and that. that. I had to keep a food diary in high school home ec, and that will blow your mind because you don't pay that much attention to what you're eating until you write it down. But, and but, you look at it the next day and you go, What did I eat? It, yeah. It, it, yes. I agree with you, Tammy. There, it's an amazing thing that everybody should do periodically. It just, you know, if, you count, if you're wanting to look at weight, just count calories for three days and you will go, Oh my goodness, yeah, no what wonder, have I been yeah. doing? Yeah. So, all right. Okay, um, question from Sioux Falls and a gentleman, I have constipation, should I take a laxative daily? So, no, no details there. But. Yeah, what do you say? Well, um, I think we've kind of covered that in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the chemical irritant laxatives ones. are not good to take long term. Herbal laxatives are not good to take long term. What's an example of an herbal <coughs> laxative? Oh, um, they call the themselves teas? herbal lax yeah. and the oh. teas and the Senna things. Yep. Okay. You have any particular reason you're against coalesce? I'm going to ask, I'm going to kind of drive that. It's kind of a stimulant. It is. It's, it's a little bit like a detergent, actually. Yeah. What about um, uh, uh, prunes? They're, they're Fine. also oh you don't, they're but they work partly because they're an irritant, a little bit. Ah, okay, That's I don't get a big negative there. <laughs> you ah. could squeak by on that one. All right. So um, all right, we're you know we've got a minute and a half minute left. Do you have any parting words of wisdom that you want our viewers to understand about bowel problems? Um. I guess I, I'd go back to, uh, since we're talking about inflammatory bowel disease, that um, this is a disorder that we have made uh, great strides with the medications that are available uh, at keeping the disease under control. There's four categories of medicines. There's the um, <coughs> uh, topical uh, anti-inflammatory medicines. They're actually chemical cousins to aspirin. Um, there's a group called steroids, which you say, oh, gee, I don't want to take steroids long term. Um, and they're not, you know, we don't like to put patients on them long term, but they're very helpful at shutting down inflammation in Insects. a hurry. Yeah. Yep. Topicals, steroids, yeah. what are the other two? Uh, an immunomodulator and biological agents. The biological agents are the new shots that are given yeah. or okay. infusions. Okay. And okay. are you using a lot of those? Fair amount. Fair amount. All right. We, you know, what a great deal to fill in for Christina Hill Jensen. Yep. Thank you so much. And Christina, get well. Yes. Yeah. Doctors, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Stay tuned. We will be right back with a homespun perspective and then what's new in medical science. Looking for reliable healthcare information online? You can start with a resources link at the On Call website. From there, you can access a variety of accurate and dependable information sources, including the South Dakota State Department of Health and Medline Plus. This month, the Scientific Journal reported the remarkable case of a 35-year-old man who took an unusual treatment for ulcerative colitis. His colon was so inflamed and sore that he had been advised by his doctors to have it surgically removed. After researching experimental therapy for ulcerative colitis, he decided to travel to Thailand where a doctor gave him 1,500 roundworm eggs to swallow. The idea that worms might have something to do with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease came from the observation that colitis is common in developed countries like America where worm and parasite infections are rare. But in contrast, colitis is rare in countries where virtually the entire population has worms living inside of them. 
This is similar to scientist David Strachan's hygiene hypothesis that was presented in the British Medical Journal in 1989. He showed data that hay fever and eczema were more common in families with one child than in larger families. And he speculated that the difference was because of an earlier and broader exposure to infections in the larger families. He suggested that more exposure to the dirty world results in less allergies. Strachan's idea has expanded and the hygiene hypothesis proposes that in developed countries as a result of a too clean environment there is an increase in the diseases of the immune system such as inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, asthma, and even childhood onset diabetes mellitus type 1. Remember however the hygiene hypothesis is still just theory. Let's get back to our patient with colitis that traveled to Thailand. To everyone's delight, after eating worm eggs, the gentleman quickly became symptom free. About three years later, after a relapse, he took more eggs and got better again. Over the six years that scientists studied the patient, they found his immune system had been changed by worm therapy and noted that his colon had increased mucus production. We're not talking night crawlers here, and some worm infections can be very harmful in humans. So people should not eat worms without physician direction. Studies are now underway using pig whip whipworms, however, which are a less aggressive worm in treating not only inflammatory bowel disease, but also multiple sclerosis. We'll see what happens. Well, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, guess I'll eat some worms. Maybe someday we'll be eating worms for colitis too. We'll be right back. In our medical news tonight, good news and bad news about falls. Falls are a real and common danger for older adults. One doctor from the Yale University School of Medicine says that given their frequency and consequences, falls are a serious health problem for older persons as heart attacks and strokes. And because of the potential for falls to cause major health concerns, the American and British geriatric societies have updated their guidelines on preventing falls. When a physician sees the need to intervene and work with a patient on reducing the risk of falls, the society's new recommendations say that efforts should be focused on five areas. First, exercise, including Tai Chi and physical therapy to improve balance and strength. Second, efforts to reduce fall risk factors in the environment, things like putting up grab bars and safety rails in the bathroom and getting rid of throw, rug, throw rugs that might slide and cause you to lose your footing. A third suggestion is cataract surgery when relevant vision problems exist and other medical interventions include medication reduction and managing low blood pressure and heart rate abnormalities. So after all this, what's the good news? Well, the same doctor that says falls are as serious as heart attacks in older adults says that there is evidence that the rate of serious fall injuries, like hip fractures, is decreasing. The doctor credits a growing awareness of fall prevention interventions with this success. And in other news, back to tonight's topic, bowel disease. A researcher from South Dakota State University's Department of Health and Nutritional Sciences is making progress in understanding inflammatory bowel disease. Associate Professor Mole Day is looking into how a compound found in plants such as cabbage, cauliflower, watercress, and broccoli can work to alleviate the symptoms of ulcerative colitis in mice. So far, results indicate that the plant compound being studied minimizes the damage that occurs in the colon tissue of the mice being studied, and it also reduces their diarrhea and the blood in their stool. Professor Day's research is funded by a grant from the National Institutes of Health, and the genesis of her work is based on an interest in the cellular mechanisms of inflammatory disease. And the next step in Day's research is to see how specific plant compounds may help and be able to fight colon cancer in mice.
While her research is mouse-based and there are no current plans to do human testing, the fact that the compound being studied has been safely consumed by humans for a long time is worth noting. And that's all for this week. Remember, On Call is rebroadcast on SDPB Digital Channel 2, Mondays at 11 a.m. Central, Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Central. And once more, I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Philip Tanner, and our medical editor, Dr. Rick Holm. Thanks to our phone volunteers, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. Have a good evening. Funding for this program is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Television. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, the Brookings Health System, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Post captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. To learn more about life and health, you can order your copy of The Picture of Health, a beautiful book containing insightful essays and evocative images by on-call medical editor Dr. Rick Holm and Dr. Judith Peterson. This book, containing health care advice, stories of medical history, and meditations on healing, can now be yours for $17 at the South Dakota Ag Heritage Museum. Call 1-877-227-0015 to order. This offer is made by Ag Bio Communications at South Dakota State University.